and the fear factors need to be eradicated. Number one, oh, I'm going to run out of vitamins. Well, you know, your liver and other parts of your body can store up to two months worth of vitamins. And I, I, when I did the research, I was shocked. Yes, there are plenty of vitamins that are stored. And that's what it's for. It's for a rainy day. The body was designed in a very supreme fashion to be able to do that, to store the micronutrients in your liver. So you, do, you don't need to be popping all those vitamins. Oh, I haven't eaten for two days, so I need to take my multivitamin. I need to, no, you, you don't have to. Do now, of course, if you are nutritionally depleted from the beginning, and, and let's say you did a spectrocell blood test, which is a test that can look at all your micronutrients and then if the water is missing and you're really depleted, yeah, you might need to take some supplements. But, you know, for most patients, they don't need to do that. Number two, fats. There's plenty of fat storage in your body. If I take away all calories from you today, you, the average person can go at least 30 to 40 days. And I'm not saying that you should, but they can. So the fear factor needs to be taken. People think that, oh my God, they missed a couple of meals. I'm starving. You're not starving. You're not going to die. You're going to be fine. You, 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 your body is supposed to have that physiology. You're supposed to subject your body to this type of flexibility. If your body is not flexible in that, in the metabolic way, then I think that you, you, you're setting yourself up for degenerative long-term diseases. So on that topic of metabolic flexibility, do you feel it's important as one clarifying point? And I'd love to hear your opinions on it. Some people recommend that first, uh, a, a patient or somebody that might be navigating this on their own goes and starts switching towards the direction of a, of a whole food diet so that before they go on a little bit of a longer you know, fast or they start even fasting for 24 hours, they're not going into almost like a deep detox that comes from going into that. What's your experience been with patients, especially ones that are more like eating processed foods, Oreos, junk food, other stuff. When they jump right into fasting, do you sometimes see that they have what would be seen as either detox symptoms or, or negative uh, reaction when they first jump in? Great, 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 great question. Yes, this is the danger. Two things. One is they, they are truly addicted to this. And there's two forms of addiction that I've discovered with these patients. Well, not me discovered it, but I, I, through experience. Firstly, there's the psychological aspect that that you know you've become Pavlovian. You know you 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 come home and the first thing you want to do is is is, is uh, uh, gorge on some junk food. Okay, it's a Pavlovian. It's that house. It's that kitchen. It's that sofa. It's it's sometimes getting into your car that you you dig for something. So we need to get rid of that Pavlovian reflex. So I tell patients, okay, when do you eat? What stimulates your thought about food? What, what, what makes you crave for it? Uh, is it certain friends that make you do it or a certain environment that do it? So that, that's, that, those are all psychological cues. And, and then the second part of it is the true chemical addiction, which I do believe that is really true because these processed foods, especially sugar, sugar is number one. It goes to the dopamine center. And now all of a sudden, the next time you eat sugar, you need more and more of it. And there's cravings. But you know what? Worse than the cravings, I have to point this out. Worse than the cravings are the fact that it changes your brain completely. There's actual neuronal pathway changes that occur in your brain. So when you are eating all those Oreos all the time, you've already got those pathways built into your brain where the rostral pathways from your dopamine center and limbic system, which go to your frontal cortex, they down-regulate it. Now, what does that mean? That means that when you're addicted to that type of food, you can't think straight about that food. That means you've become a little dumber about the intelligence of of your diet and, and your control over your diet because it wants to continue to be addicted. So you don't get so smart about it, okay? Because if you get smart, you're gonna not be an addict, addict anymore. So <laughs> it, may, it makes your frontal lobe go down in its function. And then it goes to the hippocampus. So there, there's connections that go to the hippocampus that, that actually make you remember uh, that wonderful feeling that you had when you ate um, five uh, really bad uh, processed food items in a matter of one hour. So, so you get that, you could break all these down. 
So yes, you're absolutely right. To break those neuronal pathways and the habit pathways, um, you got to bring in bring in this slowly. So you know, I do discuss with my patients how far are they along the path of of this processed food addiction and and what is the consumption. I mean, today it's really sad that almost fifty seven percent of all the calories that they're consuming these days are, are coming from processed or ultra processed foods. So you got to bring that number down. So changing the content of the diet first before we even introduce fasting. I think you're very right. You got to change what they're eating first. Because if you just go straight into dieting, they will get a lot of withdrawal symptoms. And then as I said, you know, they're going to be so dismayed and feel so bad that they'll fall off the bandwagon and they'll never come back again. So mm. do make the do make the change. You've got to give them alternative foods. You've got to show them that these foods are the ones that are non-addictive foods, non-addictive foods um, that you got to get on, which is basically whole foods, real food. If it looks like that in nature, eat it. If it's going to go bad, eat it. If it's got a barcode on it, be suspicious. Don't touch it. If it's got a food label on it, be suspicious try not to read uh, read it or eat it. Just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. So just go for real food. So people come to me and say, say you're a cardiologist, so you know, I became a vegetarian and I don't eat meat anymore. And I was one of them that believed that meat, hey, hey, this, this, this is bad stuff. You know, I'm cardiology, FACC. And I realized that the research doesn't support that. So why would red meat be, be bad for you? It, it can be. And my uh, association with that or my interest in that is that if it's grain-fed cows, you're going to have too much omega-6. That omega-6 is getting into you now. So that beef is not going to have the same concentration of fats of a a cow that's eating grass because that's a grass-fed cow. It'll have more omega-3 and it'll have more saturated fat in it, not the omega-6s. You see, you are what you eat and what that ate. So... Meat is actually okay, provided it's grass finished and, and, and thereby it doesn't have all that omega-6 in it. Chicken is okay, organic chicken. And if you eggs, organic, organic eggs. I have no problem with these foods because they are whole, they're natural. And when I put my patients on these, I guess what? I get better compliance. Because I don't, you can go ahead and eat your egg. Have your egg for breakfast. You know, just get rid of the toast. Just have your two eggs for breakfast. Cardiologists saying two eggs are fine. Yes, because the cholesterol that's in the eggs is not what's going to raise your cholesterol level. Your cholesterol is what you're making mostly in your liver. So this type of education, they get, they feel better about it and say, Doc, let me eat eggs. He lets me eat beef. He lets me eat chicken. Yeah, but I tell him it's got to be the right stuff. And then, of course, with it, you got to have your vegetables with it. So you got to make these changes in the diet so they're eating better quality food, better classes of food in the whole state with everything, just the way nature made it. If it's like that in nature, consume it. If it, can't, if it went to a factory and got changed, get rid of it. That's the bottom line. It's the bottom line, and sometimes the simplest answers still take. It's an uphill battle against the entire way that society is organized around food and pleasure and, as you've mentioned, addiction. So I want to say for anybody who's listening that is hearing this and is nodding their head along as they're listening or watching this, you know, uh, especially with you, Dr. J, working with patients, you know that there is so much past baggage that people have to let go of. Sometimes that's even trauma. Sometimes that's uh, all sorts of different components as to even though it's a simple answer, we know you're fighting an uphill battle. And for everybody who's listening that feels that they should be further along than they are, you're doing the best you can. And yes, there might still be changes that you want to make and be gentle in the process, but keep on at it because you're headed in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, you, 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 you're, you are so far ahead of everyone because you, you understand that your eating behavior is also affected by what else is going on in your life. So if you have a job that's extremely stressful, you've had a, a lot of uh, crises going on in your life, then at that point, I'm going to tell you, okay, you ought to do this, 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 and the other. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for you to do it. So when you look at dietary changes and behavioral changes in eating, you also got to look at the totality of the patient's life. How much stress is going on in his or her life? Uh, what kind of job? What can, But you know, now you're digging even more layers on that onion. You see what I'm saying? So you you gotta 
you, it's so deep. It's it's a lifestyle. So you got to say to yourself, okay, I'm Dr. J is not just talking to me about when to eat, how to eat, and what to eat. It's also talking to me about, am I happy? A- am I peaceful? Do I have purpose? Do I have connection? Am I depressed? You know, because all these factors are also going to affect not only your eating habits, but also your general health. I mean, you know, let me give you an example. I mean, it, it, my, my, we look at the attributable risk of, let's say, hypertension or cholesterol to coronary artery disease. But have you looked at the attributable risk of things like depression? It's far worse. So if you're depressed, you're a sitting duck to have a heart attack. <laughs> and, and nobody talks about that and says, okay, let's look at your risk factors or sit on your tummy if you're depressed, you fill this form up and tell you if you're depressed. And nobody's got time to do that. Your own family doctor doesn't have time to do that. And yet we don't realize that the attributable risk uh, of depression and other psychological illnesses that you might actually have are far more. Do you feel connected? You know, uh, what's your what what's your understanding of your standing in society in general? Or do you feel that you're at the bottom? Uh, do you feel do you feel that you have confidence that you can talk with? Um, all these things affect your physiology. So. Diet is big one big part of it, but all these other things are so important. And and I've got to tell you about this one study because this will really um, raise your curiosity on, on how I got involved with this. This was a study that was done at Johns Hopkins. They took medical students and uh, obviously paid them for the experiment. You put an arterial line in their radial artery and they were drawing out blood and putting it through a machine that measures your platelet reactivity. Okay? Right? So they can tell moment to moment because it's done through light as to whether the platelets are aggregating or not. So platelets, as you know, are those tiny little particles that make your blood clot, make your blood sticky, um, which you don't want because you want your arteries to be free flowing. So what happened is that they gave them a test while they're doing this and they flip through the page, they answer the questions and the platelets are happy. They And then they turn the page and now you've got a question that on, on a subject that you were never taught. These kids go crazy now. Oh my God, I don't know the answer. And guess what happened to the platelet reactivity? Changed instantaneously. Wow. This is this is so fascinating that that you know. And and, and I read the study about thirty years ago, and it stuck with me. Just, but it showed me how your moment to moment, moment to moment. I'm not saying long, even moment to moment perception of stress. Uh, affects your physiology. This is just one example. I've got hundreds of examples I can show you of how your your mental state um, affects your physiology and how your your body reacts on a moment to moment basis, down to even expression of angiotensin two receptors in your in your in your endothelium and your blood vessels. So whether you're going to actually clot right now or you're going to flow. And the number of receptors that are expressed moment, you know, we say that we have these angiotensin II receptors in our cells, right? Yeah? So we think they're fixed. They're not. Three quarters of them are involuted. They don't express themselves. Now, under certain circumstances, they'll all of a sudden express themselves. And that the, the stimulus for the expression of those receptors could be dietary, but more so it can also be psychological, how you feel. And it's amazing to me that 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 fifty thousand receptors now all of a sudden there are a hundred thousand expressing themselves. So now when the angiotensin comes along, you're going to get a hypertensive blood pressure response. Suddenly your blood pressure goes up. So we have these biochemical pathways. We know about it, but nobody's saying that. Okay, fine. Let's look at your diet, but also come on, get a handle on your life. Let's let's decrease the stress levels. Let's do some meditation. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. Fasting unleashes a whole new metabolic pathway of energy production through ketones. Growth hormone, during fasting, you get growth hormone. You get more growth hormone production 